Okay. Has that come up okay for you all? Oh. Yeah, lovely. I can see you signing to the video, which is fab. <laughs> A reassuring sign. Okay, so I'm uh, Victoria Wright and Jude Wilde's in the space as well with me. And basically what we wanted to share with you was a writing in process. Um, so it's collaborative autoethnography and obviously explicitly the, in the image here, I'm saying that we're weaving our histories through the here and now. All of our writing is absolutely temporal, isn't it? We're writing the moment at that time. And I'm going to be picking up some aspects of that as we continue. But our starting point was basically uh, reflective journaling. And really it was because we have that um, if you like, catalyst of experience in the pandemic, experience in COVID-19, being in teacher education and having some very big decisions to make. Um, for instance, who would pass the course in that timely manner that they'd expected to and who would not quite be able to, etc. There was an awful lot of things going on there, a lot of very serious um, things going on. Um, so our story in together um, I think ultimately came from a place of wanting to hear ourselves as well as hear each other and had that explicit then emotional dimension and also that um, probably that cathartic sense that I'm sure um, you will all be very, very um, in tune with. I'm going to be explicit here as well and say that our autobiographies are interconnecting. So myself and Julie have worked together for years, for something like 14 years together. We're in the same team. I've now moved to be um, a line manager, um, but we're all we're both in the team. We've both got very shared experiences of having worked in education, in further education, and then coming into higher education. So we have to be upfront here that, of course, we have a kind of an immediate and, a, and a, I would say a ready connection between ourselves, which will have supported our writing. Most importantly, what that does is we also have a friendship connected to that is it, it ensured that we were always writing with each other in a trusted space. So it's a very freeing exercise, I would say, to write in that way with somebody who you know that well and who you trust. I was writing in particular ways. So I kind of um, worked with Julie to um, construct a way of writing that we felt the most comfortable with. But we actually looked back at um, Gail, who we've just heard speaking. Um, so Ken Gale and Jonathan Wyatt. And I loved a particular paper that was, um, excuse me for looking at my notes, because I'm always keen to make sure I reference people appropriately. So it was their 2008 paper, um, Two Men Talking, a Nomadic Inquiry into Collaborative Writing. And I just absolutely loved that. It had a lot of resonance, resonance for me. What we started to do was in effect like a call and response. So I started the writing and then Julie picked up, responded back to me. And we began to actually pick up a line or two lines or however many lines we wanted to from each other's writing and write within through that. Um, it became a very productive space. And I just loved this quotation. And this is from the intensity paper. So Gail, Pelias, etc. I have been wanting to write. And that really, I think, was our starting point. We wanted to write, we wanted to communicate, share something of ourselves. I'm going to flag up this sense that it is about um, agency, that it's actually, in, in our case, I would say it was about trying to find some control somehow in a time when things were variously out of our control and pushed us um, in terms of what we wanted, what we were hoping for, for instance, for our students, was perhaps not always possible or not always possible as we expected it to be in the same way. Um, I absolutely love this as well about the spiders enchantments and enticements. That for me is a fantastic expression of how it feels to write when you do not have a specific um, goal you're not writing for something. We're not right. We were not writing for to generate a particular product. We happen to be generating a product or a share here, and um, we, we weren't writing with that in mind. We weren't writing with anything really in mind other than to come back to ourselves and think, who are we as teachers? What are we doing? What is this thing? What are we experiencing? Again, a few quotations here. So. Um, 
the plan, this made me laugh. When I saw this um, in the two men talking paper, I did chuckle to myself because I support quite a few um, kind of early researchers, writers um, to write, typically to write alongside me. And I have heard this myself. I've had this, um, Victoria said, what's the plan for this? Where's it going to go? I think, oh, that always makes me feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. because I think we have to write in the moment and the writing evolves and we build connections together. That's what we did here very explicitly. So I'm just going to move my screen a minute. This also, we go off in tangents. It's not a linear process. I was interested uh, listening to the um, talk that we've experienced just now. Um, and I think it was Helen referred to her thesis as being non-linear. My doctorate thesis, I wanted to make non-linear. Um, I was able to make it a little bit non-linear, but not as much as I would have liked. And that for me would have been more authentic. The, this, there is that authenticity of going off in other directions, developing something and coming back to a space and underpinning all of that, this, you know, going off on various trajectories, but knowing that it's going to take you somewhere is the trust. I also like in this quotation, the folding and the unfolding, because I feel like that's what we were doing. We were kind of folding ourselves in, in various ways. So I would say I've been folding my teacher self in. I've been folding in um, my teacher educator sense, which is a slightly different thing, folding my own personality in and unfolding it and having a little look at all of these different things. Um, I'm connecting that actually to um, Paul Cope with his um, art and place and that very that physicality of folding and representation that he shared so beautifully yesterday. I'm going to share with you a couple of extracts. So for me, writing, I have to be, I have to move into that physical space. It's embodied, writing is an embodied activity. I always start my writing by thinking, where am I? What is this place, space in my head? And literally, the conversations ebb and flow. That's how it felt for us. This felt like a naturally occurring, obviously grounded in the fact that we've got um, a strong knowing of each other. The call and response. So here I was just writing a little reflection back that thinking however kind of unforced this feels or easy this feels, we still have some regulation happening. We still have something that we are doing in our crafting. We are crafting because obviously we're putting word by word by word, sentence by sentence. And as it evolves, you, you recognize that there is something of a pattern. There is something that if you wanted to, you would be able to analyze. Let's say you could do a thematic analysis of it. Um, for me, I wanted to just, I wanted to keep it as open as possible. And I know Julie likewise, we wanted to keep it as expansive as possible, not never saying that we were going to analyze this or we were going to put it in a particular place. And again, for me, this is just part of my way of writing. Um, I like to think about the space as in a metaphorical and a physical space. So for me, I was thinking, this is what it feels like to me. It feels like the fields stretching in the distance, the trees, the farmhouses. I'm in a chair that creaks so much, so much I feel like I'm in a ship and therefore have to keep it, etc. That Those to me are important bits to put in the writing. Those are bits that um, give the writing another another kind of I suppose another level it's personalized it's very explicitly personalized it's very explicitly sharing some of my um thinking imagination reflections not worrying about how serious that is or how significant this is I feel like um a lot of my writing I would say is about serious play I'm playing I am actually being really serious but I'm being playful at the same time so as is so often the case now, this is Ken Gale and Jonathan Wyatt. I am writing. I don't know what I'm going to write. I've read your last piece again and I'm invigorated by what you have to say there. Exactly. Totally connected to that. Your writing, your doing is tangible. This, for me, totally sang the interaction that you are writing in the space of the other. Yes. You're bringing your whole self, aren't you? And you're putting yourself in the space of the other. 
And however you temper that is, of course, your own uh, reflection. So Julie's a little extract here. Victoria, I call. I put you in a house. In a, I'd use the visual metaphor to get us started in our storytelling. And she was saying, where are the banisters? You're taking me up the stairs, but where's the banisters? What can we hold on to as we're reflecting together? For a short while, as Julie echoes here, we are visitors in each other's biography. And I see something worthy of holding on to. It's the difference between monologue and dialogue, between closing down interpretation and staying open to other meanings. What we're doing is we are daring the platform. We're not um, closing down any of our kind of right. directions, etc. Okay, little extract just from because we'd started to really ground it in how we felt as teachers, how we felt about ourselves as teachers. So naturally, I would say autoethnography is any way about. Um, revising, reflecting, thinking back. I'm thinking of Carolyn Ellis with her meta-autoethnographies, her revisiting of her own work and her reconstruction and rethinking about those. We're always going to be storying ourselves. And I think there's that dimension where you look back and you think, let me make some more sense of this. Can I make some more sense in some way now that will feel helpful to me? So I was thinking about a particular duty of mine. So a uh, teacher education student saying that they they thought they were too quiet or too shy to be a teacher and actually I'm very shy and I shared that with them and they were really surprised by that and we just started them from that basis talking about the, this phrase the bubbles of the classroom Julie picks that up and works with it and in her way of working with it she's thinking about how she um, navigates the space that the students are in how she steps in when we're thinking about group work you step in and you step back and you read the room and you're thinking about what you're doing when you do that. The fact that some of this is actually difficult to capture, even though we're very experienced teachers, it's difficult for us to verbalise. It's actually also difficult for us to write because what that is, that sense of stepping in and stepping back is actually intuitive and emotional and reading in that full sense. We're in this house. She says, I like being in this house with Victoria, exploring, appreciating the finer <coughs> details, the knocks and scraps of lived experiences, little dents here and there to remind us of the past, a simple ebb and flow of innocent conversations. It's the place of trust. I have that with you, Victoria. Our experiences have led us here, writing alongside each other, understanding each other really very intuitively, standing alongside, though also differently. I see how you see my sense of the sensitivities of the students. And finally, we're both storytellers. We're all storytellers. Reflecting again, thinking back. So we'd written over it over quite a few months. So every now and then we were sending each other another bit of writing that responded to writing that we'd shared. Because um, in an academic environment, and because I've got a teaching and research contract, there is inevitability to me thinking, should this be more visible? Should I use this some way? If that wasn't our original intention. And I don't think that we will take it any further than this. We'll take our reflective journaling further, but I won't be publishing something on the back of this. This is a space that is just a shared open space. Reading Wyatt and Gale, again, I was excited by that. Um, about the bravery anyway of autoethnography. I mean, yesterday's um, sessions that I attended, as ever, I absolutely loved. I always think it is a privilege. I'm just going to pick up a couple of words, terms here. So mimesis is the idea that autoethnography acts as a mirror or a reflection of life and living in ways that are useful for contemplation. Absolutely. That is something that um, I think is, is very, very important. I feel like personally, um, autoethnography provides me with a space to breathe because I can um, produce, make, construct a story in whatever form I like at that time. It helps me to understand where I am and where I want to go as well, though it doesn't necessarily need to have that direct purpose. 
If it focuses our attention on reflection and engagement, Poesis asks us to consider autoethnography as a creation that makes something happen, a poetics, a way of relating to self and culture that shows how we make meaning and construct relationships on the page and in the world. Yes, this for me is, is incredibly powerful. As I say, I love autoethnography. You'll be able to hear that in me talking to you about it. I think it is fully inclusive in the most important sense not in a simple sense. The way of relating to self and culture always. So while we were writing our innocent conversations, we've obviously been able to connect to the culture of which we're a part. We have our own autobiographies that we're explicitly sharing, but we have our teacher education references as well. Julie? Gloria, can you, can you start wrapping up the first paper now? I certainly can. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> in our expanding spaces what we haven't done because today we have no purpose and have, have no particular agenda for doing so with these particular aspects there's other things we could go into whether we do don't know it's an unfolding story thank you julie for flagging thank you that's great victoria um so i think we'll we'll wait till questions um at the end of the the three papers so if you'd like to um prepare for the next one that would be brilliant thank you so thanks <laughs> share the next one now luckily you won't be hearing my voice for all of this time because you will hear my two other colleagues as well so say and Anne, are you in the space here as well i can see Anne. say are you in here She's not on camera, but I think she's here. Let me share my screen again. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. <laughs> Don't you worry, lovely, you're here. Lovely. Uh, just to remind reminder, it's eight to 10 minutes, so. Yeah. Okay. Just check it, just check in while you're setting up, people can hear me. It was a problem yeah, yesterday. I can hear you. Anne. Lovely, thank you. We can hear you. Okay, dokie, let me just put it on mommy. Oops. Forgive me, clicking in the wrong space temporarily. Just want to put it on the slideshow view. Okay, hopefully that's come up okay. Lovely. Okay, so for myself, Faye and um, Anne, this is a different one. We came together very deliberately. And the reason being that uh, we had heard about each other's research areas and our interests. And while Anne is in my team, Faye was head of secondary, now head of primary. Um, and I'd happened to have the privilege of being at her mock fiver. There was connecting theoretical concepts that we wanted to explore together. And really in order to develop um, an explicit piece, a piece of writing together to work together. So we were focusing on our professional learning experiences. And again, we were having to think about um, during the time of COVID and the impact of that on what we had been able to access, what we had been able to participate in. So we come from secondary and further education, from teacher education and professional development. What we did was we started to share multimodal artifacts but how can we start to think through our ways of learning in professional spaces and what constitutes professional learning for us? What have we been doing during this time? What had started it really was our kind of informal conversations where we were saying how much had been online and free during that time. And therefore, perhaps that we've been able to access things that we might have been a little bit hesitant accessing before, either because we didn't feel like we were... Um, perhaps as confident in that area, we felt like we were testing, testing spaces in a way that was helpful to us, that told us that actually we could contribute there, we could participate there. Curious and curiouser, obviously Alice in Wonderland reference, we, may, we will remain very curious about what kinds of learning are open to us and what kinds of learning most inform our sense of ourselves. So we'll see if you, if you want to, please share in the chat 
what you feel has been most helpful to you in your learning. I'm just going to share quickly and move to Anne so that she can share likewise. So when I shared an artifact, um, I decided to share an image. So I picked up this image and I then wrote a little bit about it. And we recorded ourselves talking about what that meant. So my reflection was really that I felt like when it came to my professional learning experience during, during that time, I was kind of looking in, I was optimistically thinking that there will be something that I want to get at. And then when I looked, I could see things that I definitely wanted to, um, to work with, to think about. There was also, I'm going to say mandatory training, lots of formal training, which for me sometimes kind of tug at me. It's not quite what I wanted for myself, but it's things that I feel like I have to do. Uh, but there's movement. There's ripple scudding, there's darker patches, there's lighter pools. Um, for me, I'm going to connect that to my next slide for you. So I'm going to say that the unconsciously learning is the everyday conversations. So we talked a little bit about how we missed the down the corridor conversations, the little chairs that you could do face to face. The informal learning, Again, the learning with the everyday conversations, but informal learning sometimes in just going into MS Teams for what we call the coffee catch up, that kind of thing, and learning in that space together. Formalized learning, this bit, these bits are kind of tug at me. There was the actively learning, I want to be in that space, I want to find out more about that. Learning for a particular purpose, I have a particular goal project, whatever it is in mind. And um, throughout all of this, what we've been doing is problematizing learning and problematizing <coughs> professional learning. We could bring all sorts of papers to this, but we thought we would prioritize the story share here. So it's connecting and assimilating, transforming and reframing. Really, that is how I would want to badge learning in this sense. The learning that I've done, can I make connections to it? Does it resonate for me to some way? In which case, I will assimilate it. I'll take it in. I hope to transform it. I hope to do something with it. I hope to reframe it. I hope to make it um, part of who I am, but certainly what I'm expressing. I feel like what I've done during this time is I've inhabited a space at a time. I've inhabited an online space. I've inhabited a space in, in Teams, in a conference, I've had a kind of a moment of learning, then it's up to me how I take that forward. Can I just remind everyone if you're not presenting to mute yourself so that we can't hear the background, that would be really <laughs> helpful. Somebody's washing their dishes, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't mind that as my problem, but that's all right. <laughs> and I've just got a couple of references in here in case anybody's interested in picking up a little bit more so this is Mockler's paper it's fantastic paper on teacher professional development and she, what she's talking about is the contrast between the fixed mandatory um, and the what she calls authentic professional learning and that's really been at the heart of mine and Anne's and Faye's discussions what is the authentic learning for us some of these have real resonance for us, that it's active, that it supports you in experimenting, that it's collegial and collaborative, that it might simply be stimulated by curiosity. I'm going to move forward to Anne's slides. So Anne, I should let you take up the baton. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, so this is my artifact that I created, um, which was an image of a sort of a fusion of three different elements. You'll see in the background uh, what I called my data wall. It was enormous. It was a wall. It was um, my way of sorting my doctoral um, data um, from qualitative research. So there was a vast amount and a spreadsheet just didn't do it. I needed to get tangible and start moving things around. It was a real cut and stick. So that's the background. And that was very prominent during this period that we're talking about for me. Um, and the fact that I was doing it sort of very much on my own too. Um, 
And then also there's the works of uh, Henry Lefebvre in particular, uh, the rhythm analysis. And I put the book there because that was sort of um, really threading through my time, through my research, but also res resonating with me personally, as I'll mention in a moment. Um, and finally, the other part of the image is the headphones, uh, the, the dreaded headphones that came into my life that I'd never expected to experience as, as, in such a significant way during the pandemic and um, became a core tool for, for my work. Work, um, as as uh, many have experienced also. Uh, so um, reflecting on the image, I find um, this is really a my period of, of um, learning was very much um, characterised by the interruption to professional life, as Victoria said, the ad hoc conversations, missing those interpersonal elements, um, but also making sense of learning alone and the sense that I needed to make things more physical, more tactile, maybe as an antidote to the screen work, um, but maybe as a, another way of sort of communicating with myself. Um, so thinking about um, Le Favre, because Le Favre was um, what I was uh, drawing on his work very much for my thesis, um, it also resonated with me personally. So I, I, I naturally looked uh, to, to, to this work to, to inform my understanding of what was going on. Uh, so Le Favre very much uh, looked at the rhythms of everyday life from his Paris window, looking down on a junction uh, in the courtyards of Paris. Uh, this sort of inspired me and helped me to look at the rhythms and how the balance of life had shifted for me with, in terms of professional learning, um, especially. So, you know, the, the elements had been disturbed, um, a previous sort of unconscious harmony that, that, that I hadn't even realised was there was was disrupted and in what um, the favourite would have called um, an arrhythmia, um, where rhythms break apart and by past synchronisation and this really um, meant something to me at the time um, you know and the the whole concept of looking at things with your head your memory and your heart also um, when you look at these rhythms uh, resonated too uh, so you know in consequence I think I encountered uh, different rhythms and different spaces during this time and I felt they restricted me. Um, but I think I can now see a part of now seeing this is the rhythm analysis perspective, but part of it is talking to Victoria and Faye also in the sharing process that that within those restrictions, there were new layers of possibility. Um, so for example, my work with my participants, although this was online, uh, not not as planned, um, there were very rich encounters there. So, uh, you know, another examples also. Um, before I pass on to Faye, I'll just end with a, a little quotation from Lefebvre there at the end, um, which inspires us to go deeper, looking for, but not just looking for, but to grasp all the elements of rhythms that you see around you and that you can connect with. Uh, so you're seeing everything and every nuance of everything in its own space, time and in its place. Uh, so I think that's that's my sharing. I'm going to pass over to Faye now. OK, thank, thank you. Just to say that that's 10 minutes, but, um, you know, it is fascinating. I don't want to stop Faye from speaking, but yeah, if you can try and be quick. <laughs> thank, be. You. thank you. Um, so my chosen artefact was the classic game of Connect Four, um, which I owned in the 1980s. Um, and I was drawn to the Connect Four game when reflecting on my professional learning, as I was thinking about the pieces of my professional learning and how I make connections between my experiences um, that are of different nature and different type um, in different places and from other times. Um, and then I also reflected on gameplay and strategy. So sometimes for professional development, um, it's not your turn, there's obstacles in the way. Um, and sometimes you need to look for other opportunities in other directions. Um, and there are choices to make in terms of the nature, type and scale of professional development. Um, so further reflection led me to this 3D version of the game. Um, professional learning is not linear, but has multiple dimensions, the nature, the type, the place, and then that professional learning that's situated in place and time. Um, so there are opportunities for alignment between the pieces of professional learning. And finally, professional learning is a more fun activity, I found, if undertaken with others. And I definitely felt that loss um, during that time when we, we couldn't access that so readily. Um, so to summarise, um, my experiences during the pandemic was that 
my access changed. I found it easier to schedule around commitments and things were more accessible through online or, or recorded activity. Um, funding, in fact, cheaper to attend often the online events. Um, but those spaces that were provided by social media and those informal, what might be termed grassroots professional development, which I found I then engaged more in than I had more so than I had before. Um, so there were more opportunities, but I missed that naturally occurring professional um, that you know, is naturally occurring professional development opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, really, really excellent. So um, thank you. And we, as I said earlier, we'll have some questions. Hopefully we'll have some time for some questions and chat at the end. So thanks. Thanks very much. I think up next we've got uh, Rashi and Anna. Thank you. Yeah, hi. I'm just hi. getting my share screen sorted. Is that visible? Awesome. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone. I am, oh, am I still visible? Hi, uh, I'm Rashi, third year medical student at Imperial College London. And I'm speaking from India right now. I would have loved to make it in person, but Bristol's a bit of a trek for me. <laughs> Um, so about a year ago, me and Anna, my lovely mentor and expert in medical education research, embarked on this sort of collaborative autoethnography, um, reflections about the impact of cultural differences on the journey to becoming a doctor. Um, I'll speak a bit about that now. So um, the objectives of our collaboration were to critically explore cultural differences in my lived experiences that of an Indian girl born and raised in India, but attending medical school in the UK, and reflect on the impact of these experiences on my journey to becoming a doctor. Um, what I've learned is the doctor-patient relationship is central to positive health outcomes, and medical schools have a crucial role to prepare ideal future doctors to provide the best patient-centered care. And patient-centered care is underpinned by ethical and philosophical values whereby each patient should be regarded as a person with individual needs, wishes, and resources based on their lived experiences. And because that's a person with their own set of cultural ideological beliefs. Now, in increasingly multicultural societies, ideal future doctors will need to be critically aware of not only their own social cultural beliefs, but also of their patients, and reflecting on theirs and their patients' cultural and ideological location will impact on the quality of care that the patient receives. Um, the fundamental base of our autoethnography was my journal, which contained a series of these reflective vignettes and epiphanies I experienced. Um, and then we conducted these dyadic autoethnographic interviews just to tease out the greater relevance of these personal stories and then link it to academic literature and studies. And this whole process was like an iterative one. Um, so while on doing this, basically um, a few themes emerge. And for the sake of this presentation, I'm dividing it into two themes and discussing them one at a time, but they are very much intertwined. Um, and they are the expert patient and the doctor patient relationship and the ideal doctor embodying cultural norms of the place. And I'll go over them one by one, I guess. Um, but so these are two vignettes I'd like to read out that really, I guess, underpin my discussion. Um, first one is, quote, um, in the UK, I'm taught that the doctor-patient relationship is formed by a two-way collaborative effort. The patient is an expert in their own condition, is a line that really stuck with me. Every discussion surrounding patient communication has undertones of the patient is an integral part of the healthcare team. And on the flip side, in my healthcare experience in India, I've seen patients explicitly tell doctors not to explain them the medical facts and just simply begin with the management they deem appropriate. On the other hand, I've also seen patients with the same doctor ask questions for hours to understand the exact physiology of their disease and before agreeing to move on to any management plan. Um, yeah, so, so, these two vignettes that explore the idea of a patient being an expert in their condition 
how expert is the patient? According to me, an expert is a person knowledgeable in a particular area. So people can be classified as experts in their own life because no one knows more about their aims, goals, more than they do. But in the medical context, the patient is the most knowledgeable about how their disease has impacted their day-to-day -day life. But the healthcare team is more knowledgeable about the disease presentation, progression, management. So does a patient's ex expertise impact on the quality of care provided to them? So studies have illustrated that it's possible to provide high quality care in consistent, it, which is consistent with the patient's wishes, even if those wishes aren't uh, consistent with the standard medical course of action, the overall best decision can only be made as a collaborative effort between the doctor and the patient, because the doctor knows what's medically best and the patient knows everything about that. So ideally there has to be a bilateral exchange of information and then a jointly made decision that doesn't harm the patient's health yet respects their wishes. Um, the second theme, the ideal doctor, I'll again read my two vignettes. In India, I've seen the doctor-patient relationship go one of two ways. Commonly, doctors are treated like gods. Ideal, the ideal doctor is supposed to know what's wrong with the patient and what to do about it. Patients, more often than not, do not consider themselves an expert in their condition. If a doctor has studied for 10 plus years, why are they asking me what I think about my condition? If I knew what's wrong, why would I need a doctor? They probably don't know what they're talking about. Let's go find another doctor. Whereas on the flip side, in the UK, an ideal doctor is empathetic, kind, friendly. Of course, they must be clinically competent, but these soft skills have such a rising importance. For example, trigger warning. I saw a young distressed woman in emergency. She was having a miscarriage, but it was a busy night. So the on-call doctor didn't seem to address her concerns. And they just paged the gynecologist. Um, the patient conveyed to me how absolutely distraught she was where she, she didn't know what was happening, she didn't understand it, and this whole situation made her feel very isolated. But on follow-up, she said that her experience with a gynecologist was completely different. She felt comforted, understood, supported, because they took the initiative to explain things to her and made sure she understood, and she was her. So um, these vignettes explore the seemingly juxtaposing stance of the UK and Indian cultural context on the notions of an ideal doctor. Is ideal a universal term or is it context bound? The Indian Medical Commission encourages doctors to be good diagnosticians, which amongst other things, comprises of quick treatment with minimal invasion and intervention so as to not prolong unnecessary testing and ambiguity, which will increase the patient's anxiety. This also reflects on the Indian cultural norm, which suggests that a doctor is an expert in their medical niche in the same way a lawyer is in the law, any other professional is. So if a person's coming to the doctor for help, it's because the doctor is an expert, not the patient. On the other hand, the UK General Medical Council explicitly states requirements to, for, for future doctors, the requirement is to demonstrate the principles of person-centered care. Studies in the UK have recognized the importance of empathetic and sensitive communication, patient-doctor partnership, and teamwork between the doctor and the patient. So both the Indian and British medical boards allude that the overarching role of a doctor in society is to maximize the patient's health and happiness. So if that goal is somewhat universal, are the apparent differences in the virtues of an ideal doctor simply different paths leading to a shared outcome? Conclusions. So in summary, we, uh, through this whole pro process, learned that concluded that in increasingly multicultural societies, ideal future doctors will or already are, being, are providing care to patients from diverse cultural backgrounds. It all comes, um, and these patients all come in with their own unset expectations and set of cultural values, norms, and beliefs. Different cultures seem to have different norms about what's considered acceptable or the expected interaction between a doctor and a patient. These norms also seem to define the patient's expectation from a doctor, which by nature will shape the role of a future doctor in that context. A lack of mutual understanding and communication is bound to influence this relationship, which will impact the quality of care and then the patient's treatment. So medical schools have a crucial role to prepare these ideal future doctors who can recognize the cultural needs of different groups and 
to facilitate the development of such skills of basic cultural competency and cultural humility by formally addressing it in the medical curriculum. This can be done by designing purposefully aligned cultural competency training modules and activities for both medical students and faculty, which will allow a better understanding of how patients, how a patient's cultural context influences their perception of disease, which will in turn improve quality of care and promote better health outcomes. On reading some papers, I realized that some of these things have been trialed in certain places around the UK, and it can be achieved by using a series of lectures, large and small group workshops, role plays, but mainly constant reflective self-assessment. The key feature is to expose participants to different cultural scenarios, enabling them to question their own perspective and reflect on their own experiences of being from the other culture. And this may spark an evolution of perspective, which plays a crucial role in growth and learning, especially in the context of cultural humility and competency. Um, these are my references. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to me. That's brilliant. Thanks, Rashi. That's really, really good. Um, so uh, we've got a few minutes for some questions and comments.